Um, I had the pleasure of being at the, um, the forum that the Spr Silver Springs Alliance hosted in Ocala. And two days before I attended the forum, I went to Silver Springs for the first time in 25 years with my children. And I was alarmed at what I saw. What, what once was a thriving, almost aquarium-like, beautiful um, th view through the glass bottom boats was much greener than I remembered, much cloudier than I remembered, as well as the fish life is almost non-existent. In fact, we were thrilled to to see a large gar swimming along instead of what I remembered as a kid. I thought, well, maybe I just had a, you know, a, um, a, a memory that was bigger than what I remembered as a kid until I heard that the biomass is actually down 92%. So what I actually saw was real. And unfortunately, it's not the same Silver Springs I enjoyed back in the 70s, and we'll hear more about that. But again, this is not just about Silver Springs. It's not just about the St. Johns River. This is about Florida waters. And I believe this ranch that is requesting 13.6 million gallons of water a day from an overtaxed um, aquifer is actually an issue that's gonna do one of two things. This process is gonna show that we as a community can have a voice and use it to use existing Florida law to protect our environmental resources, or it's gonna be illustrate how existing law is failing our natural resources, and we hope it's the first option. But just to let you know what is going on so you can engage and you can have a voice in this important issue protecting the waters of our great state, I wanna introduce you to the first speaker of our panel. I had the opportunity today to spend several hours in the sun, so if my head's shining red, I apologize for that, with our panel. We were actually raising awareness um, for this issue and the fact that we want to protect Silver Springs by waving signs along a roadway along 318 and had the pleasure of meeting John Moran. John is a celebrated nature photographer who has been known for showing beautiful, gorgeous pictures of our beloved state and all the great resources we have. But then he realized that these pictures may be telling a story that's not quite accurate. He started using his journalistic skills to focus on the challenges we have in nature and making sure that he sh he's showing through his gift of photography what's at risk and what we need to do to, again to get organized, to, to work with him to expose these risks and do what we can do to protect what's le left of our beautiful state. And with that, I would bring John up. Welcome, and um, welcome John Moran, please. Thank you, Lisa, and hello, Jacksonville. It's great to be with you. I'm a nature photographer whose limits of my travels ordinarily range from Cedar Key to Sop Choppy and Bacahatchee to Loxahatchee. Um, ordinarily, I give upbeat programs that focus on the bliss and the beauty of chasing the light and waiting for the moment as I search for the soul of Florida, but we live in different times that invite a different kind of a program. I begin by acknowledging the challenge of maintaining hope in trying times. We who love what's real about Florida, we who care, we who feel instinctively what a gift beyond measure it is to call this place home. We now face a crisis of spirit as we summon the will to try to figure out how best to carry on. As you well know, budgets for DEP and the water management districts have been eviscerated and Florida Forever has been effectively eliminated. The Department of Community Affairs was killed by the legislature last year, functionally, and comprehensive land use planning in Florida is now a thing of the past. And Governor Scott picked Earth Day last year to tell the EPA to back off in enforcing clean water standards in Florida. All this was done with a free-for-all mentality that even as our state is choking on sprawl and our rivers and lakes and springs increasingly are covered in slime. Tallahassee, it seems, has turned its back on natural Florida. Floridians look to our elected leaders to protect our natural legacy, but many of our leaders respond with willful indifference to the environment. We know that ecological destruction in Florida is nothing less than economic suicide, and yet we live in a time when this self-evident truth scarcely seems to matter. If you're looking for environmental leadership in Tallahassee, you'll have to look to the history books. And in fact, it was 40 years ago that Governor Rubin asked you to invoke those very words, and I repeat for emphasis, ecological destruction in Florida is nothing less than economic suicide. 
I can't recall truer words ever being uttered by a politician here in Florida, and yet it's hard to imagine such a statement emanating from Tallahassee today. What Askew gave voice to was the recognition that no matter how you define the good life here in Florida, that the health of our economy is inseparable from the health of our environment. And in fact, the very idea of Florida as a place of natural abundance and clean water is our calling card to the nation and to the world. Our current crop of leaders in Tallahassee would do well to heed the wisdom of the words of former Interior Secretary Stuart Udall, who said that over the long haul of life on this planet, it is the ecologists and not the bookkeepers of business who are the ultimate accountants of life on the planet. It appears that we've created a political culture that knows the price of everything but the value of little and fails to acknowledge that the earth is at the very center of our existence and makes an economy possible. So how did we get here? I believe our current state of affairs is emblematic of a deeper disconnect that we seem to have from the natural world. I believe that what we have here in Florida is a certain poverty of spirit born of a disconnect from a sense of place. Place matters. And I believe that our bond with our place on the planet is one of the most deeply felt needs of the human soul. For some residents, and perhaps especially transplants, establishing spirit connection with a sense of place seems to be a bit challenging. As is keeping track of my notes here, apparently. <laughs> As the great Florida writer Albert famously put it, Florida increasingly is populated by people whose bodies are here, but whose hearts continue to reside elsewhere. And many of these residents leave Florida in their final trip in a box so their bodies can rejoin their hearts for burial elsewhere. But what about us? What about you and me and all those caring Floridians whose bodies and hearts are very much here? What about us, those of us who love this place profoundly and whose hearts are broken when we look around and we see a Florida we no longer recognize? <laughs> now more than ever, I have found that my cameras are essential tools, not just to inform and hopefully inspire, but on a personal level to, to plumb new depths of my own connection with my place on the planet. So let's take a look and see a bit of some of what I've seen and perhaps to feel a bit too of what I've felt. So it's my job to photograph the alligators, and beaches, and birds, and rivers, and lakes, and trees, and turtles, and flowers that make this the incredible place that we call home. Many of these pictures are from a long-term statewide book project to photograph natural Florida. Each of Florida's 67 counties will get a six-page spread in my book to be called One State, Many Worlds. And doing the math, that's a 400-page love letter to Florida in its years from completion. Really, it's, it's a life project. Photography reminds us why we fell in love with Florida in the first place, and I've seen that pictures have a way of reaching people in ways that words alone cannot. And so the core of my job as a nature photographer is to be amazed and to bring back evidence that ours is a state yet rich in the abundant gifts of nature. The writer Wallace Stegner said that if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. And so I've made it my life's work to know exactly where I am in the wild heart of Florida. Water, of course, is the defining element here in Florida. Indeed, it is our spiritual lifeblood Lots of places have beautiful beaches and bays and rivers and lakes, but Florida alone is home to the world's largest and most impressive array of fresh water springs. Liquid bowls of light, in the words of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the springs of Florida are a source of utter enchantment. I'd heard about the springs of North Florida as a school kid growing up in Fort Myers, and my personal odyssey of discovery began soon after I arrived in Gainesville to attend the University of Florida in the 1970s. I'd head out for the springs of the Santa Fe and the Suwannee Rivers and onto the springs of the Ocala National Forest. 
and so began a love affair of more than 35 years. And to this day, I can think of nothing I'd rather do more than seek out these incredible gems of the Florida landscape. In time, Itchituckney Springs emerged as my favorite. This is Florida's most popular summer tubing river, and I love to see people enjoying their state park. But I prefer a different kind of experience, and I like to go in the off season. 27 years ago, I began a birthday tradition of going to the Itchituckney every year on the 17th of May. That's right, on Thursday of this week, I'll be back. Often alone, sometimes with family or friends, but always with a deep sense of wonder and gratitude. And in recent years, pain. About a decade ago, I saw that even the protection of a state park couldn't keep the problems of the world away, and a thick sludge of algae fueled by a spike in groundwater nutrients began to take over the lovely eelgrass and clouded the water. And so what you see here is the view at Devil's Eye Spring on the Itchtuckney in 1995 and the identical view 11 years later in 2006. Slime began appearing in other Florida waters too, of course. Here's the view last summer at Fanning Springs State Park. This is another picture that you're not gonna see in the state tourism brochures. Folks, trust me, I really just wanted to be a nature photographer making pretty pictures, but it seems that reality has gotten in the way. Our state is drying up from drought and groundwater over pumping. Here's the chain of lakes in the Apalachicola National Forest as seen three years ago, and the identical view as seen three weeks ago. I did an aerial photo flight last week to take a look at some of the lakes of north central Florida. This is the lake that I've lived on in Gainesville, Noonan's Lake, for almost 40 years. And here's Lake Brooklyn in Keystone Heights. And of course, our springs are drying up, not just from drought, but from groundwater over pumping. Last August, I accompanied the, the wonderful Florida water journalist, Cynthia Barnett, and a group of seniors on a tour of historic Kissingen Spring in Polk County, which now alternates between being bone dry and a stagnant puddle. In 1950, Kissinger became the first major spring in Florida to cease flowing from human causes, in this case, nearby phosphate mining operations. Folks, I want you to look at these pictures of old Kissingen. This place added immeasurably to the life of its community, and you can be damn sure that it would be unthinkable to the people depicted in these photos that this spring would one day cease to flow. For years, there's been talk of building a pipeline from so-called water-rich North Florida to Central and South Florida. And with that in mind, I headed out with friends for the Suwannee River one day last June to see how the river was faring during yet another summer of drought. North of White Springs, a friend was able to jump across the Suwannee in a single bound. Next up was a stop at historic White Sulphur Springs. And it seems a distant, mem distant memory now that this was once a clear flowing spring. This was the spring in its heyday when trainloads of tourists a day would come to take the healing waters. Convict springs on the Suwannee went dry last summer, and hydrologists think that the next spring to die will be Suwannee Springs. Here's an old friend checking out the iconic brick arch of Suwannee Springs. I remember how lovely this spot was when I last photographed my friend here 20 years ago. Again, the issue here is not just drought, but groundwater over pumping. Hydrologists at the Suwannee River Water Management District have shown that springs are losing their flow in part, it's true, because of lawns being watered right here in Jacksonville, 70 miles away. I also checked out Peacock Springs last summer. The water looked dark and uninviting, and a sludge of algae covered the spring in the background. The growth of algae in our springs is fueled by sewage and manure and fertilizer, and it breaks my heart to see it this way. This doesn't look at all like the spring that I fell in love with when I first visited Peacock Springs on a long bike ride from Gainesville in the summer of 1977. I made this picture of the identical view 20 years ago. When I hear the phrase, I want my America back, this is what I think of. Let me tell you, I want my Florida back. I want my springs back. I want to live in a state where it would be unthinkable that we the people would allow the loss of such a precious natural legacy as we have in our beloved Florida Springs. 
This is Bower Springs in Gainesville, as seen about 20 years ago, with its lovely old brick waterworks building, which is now on the National Register of Historic Places. This spring was for many years the source of Gainesville's drinking water and was instrumental in luring the University of Florida to locate in Gainesville after the city offered the university unlimited free water from this very spring. And this is Bower Springs today. Actually, this was Bower Springs yesterday. I just made this photo. Here's Pitt Springs on Econfina Creek in the Panhandle, where the Northwest Florida Water Management District has just finished pumping a few hundred thousand dollars into improving public access. But let's take a look at what the public can now access and compare that to the identical view 20 years ago. We need a new way of thinking about water here in Florida, it seems clear to me. Or the Florida that we say we love will scarcely be a place that our children's children will want to live or work or play. To borrow a phrase that's popular these days in Tallahassee, we need to get to work and we need to begin by ending the denial. We can't possibly solve our problems until we admit that we have a problem. Check out these quotes from one of Florida's top business leaders. This is Lafayette Blue Springs State Park on the Suwannee. Here's a picture I made about 10 years ago. So we look to Tallahassee for leadership and this is what we get. This quote is from the governor's Earth Day directive last year telling the EPA in effect, don't mess with Florida. Now folks, this may look like a picture of some pretty skanky algae at Itchtuckney Springs State Park, but really it's a picture of denial. My pictures from the Itchitochne were used in a then and now postcard campaign mounted by the, um, the environmental group Florida's Eden in Gainesville last year to mail to legislators. If I could talk to the governor, I would love for him to explain the disconnect between what he says and what we see. And so I mailed a postcard invitation to the governor last June, inviting him to a museum program that I was doing in Tallahassee. I told the governor that he was welcome to take the stage and help us make sense of it all but he was a no-show. Meanwhile, I returned to the Itchtuckney last August and the algae continues to get worse. Folks, this may look like a picture of algae, but really this is a picture of an economic disaster in the making. Now, I grant you that our current crop of legislators didn't cause Florida's water problems. Our watered down water laws are the results of 40 years of quote unquote reasonable people arguing either that there's not a problem or that we can't afford to fix it. And I grant you that Rick Scott isn't responsible for the sliming of our waters, but as governor of the state of Florida, he is the lead official responsible for the cleanup. When Scott took the oath of office last year, he swore to support, protect, and defend the constitution of the state of Florida. And the Florida constitution, article two, section seven, plainly reads, that it shall be the policy of the state to conserve and protect its natural resources and scenic beauty. Adequate provision shall be made by law for the abatement of air and water pollution and for the conservation and protection of natural resources. Maybe the governor simply doesn't realize the reality of our springs in decline. He's pretty new to Florida and maybe he's never actually been to one of our springs. Maybe he's only actually seen a spring in a picture from a pretty postcard or a calendar and he's been led to believe that all is right with the world. So I would love to spend the day with the governor on the Itchituckney. Governor, what do you think? <laughs> all right. Governor Scott, what a great pleasure to see you out here in God's great creation. Welcome to the formerly pristine Itchituckney Spring State Park, Governor. Wow, that slime is looking pretty disgusting. Man, if this picture gets out, this surely can't be good for the tourism economy. What do you think, Governor? Oh my gosh. Folks, I'm stunned. To borrow from Mark Twain, sometimes I can't decide whether Tallahassee is being run by smart people who are putting us on or imbeciles who really mean it. When children and tourists go to the springs for the first time and they say, <laughs> when children and tourists go to the springs for the first time and they say they don't see a problem, that's understandable. If you've never been to a spring before, then how would you know what it used to look like? But when our political leaders shrug and plead ignorance, that is willful indifference and should not be confused with responsible oversight. We deserve better. But the springs will not get better until Tallahassee feels the heat of our collective outrage at this continuing assault on natural Florida. We need to get the word out. 
I'd love to see this picture of the governor used on a mail-in postcard for Floridians who value clean water to send to their legislators. Or maybe it's time to think big. Maybe we need to meet people where they are, and maybe we should get this thing up on a billboard on Interstate 95 or the Turnpike, huh? And we need to communicate our clean water message in a language that is understood in Tallahassee, and that is the language of money. We need a new way of thinking about water in Florida, how we use it, how we value it, and how we conserve it. A way of thinking that doesn't pit environmental preservation against economic prosperity. We need to remember that water is at the very heart of the Florida experience. Water is what connects us, and water is what defines us. I needed to be reminded of that, and so last summer I went to a couple of springs near Orlando to spend the day, Wakaiwa Springs and Rock Springs, and I loved it. I spent the day in a pair of parks that were overflowing with people in love with Florida. The real Florida, Floridians making memories, slowing down long enough to connect with the earth and with each other, soaking up the beauty and the bounty of the gifts of a living planet. And as I think back on those old pictures of what used to be Kissingen Spring, God, how I hope that the pictures that I'm making today don't someday become merely a catalog of what once was. As Lyndon Johnson said, if future generations are to remember us with gratitude rather than contempt, we must leave them a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning and not just after we were done with it. So we need many tools in our kit for the battles ahead, including hope, perseverance, and wonder. Yes, wonder, which I believe is an essential survival skill. And so as we encourage our leaders on the path to wisdom, let us take the time to slow down and deeply connect with the source of our resolve, and that is the timeless wonder of Florida, the real Florida, the one and only Florida. For as Socrates said, wisdom begins in wonder. I want to thank you folks so much, and I want to thank you for all that you do to make tomorrow a better day in Florida. Thank you. Excuse me a second. I, um, I do a lot of public programs, and I really am struggling to, to send people out of the room not feeling like, like I've just beaten up on them with a message of despair. And we so need to find a place in our hearts to channel that part of us that just gives us a reason to go on. And that reason is still out there if, if, we, if we just tap deep into the experience of being fully alive and fully connected with the gift of being able to call Florida home. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, and I love you people for what you're about and what you're about to walk out of this room and do after this program tonight. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I was about to say, if that didn't get you, well, you must not have a pulse, but I see it got everyone in the room, and thank you for that great um, respect and applause for John. That was phenomenal.